I'm going to choose a committee of six. Every time I choose a committee of six from the nine, I'm also choosing who I lift, leave over. That's a committee of three from the nine. So you can actually prove this formula if you want to do by working out both sides and showing they're the same. But it's much easier to think of it in terms of a combination and, uh, and, and then the reason why it must be true is obvious. Did anybody have any particular questions about any of the homework exercises so far? Professor, I have a question about exercise 16, page 44. Page 44, exercise 16. Okay, so let's look at that. Four men and four women. We have four men and four women. And they're gonna stand in line for a camera shot. And how many ways can that be done? Well, basically, does order matter here? That's the first question. No. Yes. Does it matter if, if, if we have A, B, and C, for example, and C, B, and A, is that the same picture? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It doesn't oh. matter. It's the same group of people, but it's not the same picture, or it's not the same list. Agreed? So order doesn't matter. So essentially, I have eight wow. people. I can put any of eight people in the first position then seven, then six, all the way down to one. So I have eight factorial choices. Again, if I was asking in how many ways can I put them in a, all eight of them in a committee, there's only one such committee. But anytime I move somebody around, I'm getting a different positioning for the picture. Okay? What was the second part of that? And how many ways if men and women are to alternate? Okay. Oops, where'd that go? If they're to alternate, I can do this, men, and then I have the women like so, right? Four and four. So I can put any of four men in the first position, then three, then two, and then one. And then the women can go four, three, two, one. And by the way, since multiplication, A times B is the same as B times A, I could write this part as four factorial times four factorial. Am I done? Is that the correct answer? No. Why not? Because you can also have it opening with women starting. Right, I could have just as well started with a woman. So we get the exact same answer again because the numbers were rigged. So I double that, and now that's my answer. Why does it matter if you're going to put the woman first or the man first? You're still going to end up with four factorial but times four factorial. Sure it does. It's always four factorial, right? If I went with the woman, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, woman, four, three, two, one. Man. So you can have men four, three, two, one. It's going to be right. So I get four factorial twice. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I misunderstood that. Okay. That's oh. what's clear. I'm multiplying them together. Okay. Um, next thing. C. And how many ways, if they, if they are to alternate, that a particular man and a particular woman insist on standing next to each other? Um, how the hell did I do that? Let's see. Okay, so here's what we have. Again, let me just get the picture. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You remember what I told you the first time we handled and started these problems? Questions sound very easy, but they're not always easy. This is a tricky one. I'm trying to remember. Now, men and women are to alternate. So here's what I have. I'm going to have this man and this woman together. And then I have uh, three men left and three women left, right? So here, let's look at it this way. Um, so 
Suppose I begin with a man and a woman, right? Now I'm just thinking out loud. Where can I put them? You either could put it in like the front. I could put them here. Two. Here. I have seven positions for them, right? Now, if I'm going man, woman, what must, what must what must go here? So I'm assuming the star represents all the possible places I can put the man and the woman in that order. Everybody got that? Well, if I'm doing that, then this must be a man, right? So how many choices do I have for this? So man, woman. So, so now, so now here's basically what's left is I have these these six positions, right? If I chose any one of these, this has to be a male, this has to be a male, and this has to be a male. Similarly, this has to be a female, this has to be a female, this has to be a female. So this is three factorial times three factorial. And I have seven positions where I put the other people, right? That's where the seven stars are. But this is assuming I began with a man woman. Couldn't I just as well begun, begun with a woman man? Yeah. Started this way. Then he's exactly, be... exactly the same. So all I have to do now is double my answer. And by the way, that was a hard problem. I mean, I did it quickly because I've done this problem a couple of times you know, over the years and different variations, but that's hard. But that was number six. Was there more to this? And how many ways in a particular man and a particular woman do not stand together? Well, that's, we just figured out, here's a number of ways where they can stand, uh, where they do stand together. And we noticed the total number of ways they alternate was, do they have to alternate? In part D, they're not alternating. And how many ways are they, if they are to alternate and, okay. So here's a number of ways in which they alternate, right? And sit together, the particular man and a particular woman, right? And we showed above the total number of ways they can sit together and alternate. What was that? Uh, uh, two times four factorial times four factorial. Was that right? This is the total number of ways. Um, so if I subtract, here's where they do sit together. Here's the total number of alternations. The difference between the two must be where these two people do not sit together. Okay. Were there any other questions that bothered anybody? And by the way, this was a hard question, all right? Hard questions appear in homework, generally don't appear in exams, hopefully. Anybody else have any other questions? I had a question about number 22. On where, same page? Um, 45. From three Democrats and two Republicans. Again, which one am I doing on number 22? A committee of three is to be chosen. That contains, that contains at least two Democrats. Okay, so okay, so let's let's do it the right way, and then we'll try to figure out what's wrong here. Okay, so in how many ways can I choose a committee that can need at least two Democrats? So what does that mean? Um, at least two Democrats mean I have either two Democrats on the committee or 
three Democrats on the committee, right? So um, I'm choosing a commit. Let me make sure I, I got the problem right. So let me tell. From um, three Democrats and two Republicans, a committee of three should be chosen, getting at least two Democrats. Okay. Well, how do I choose at least a two Democrats? Well, if I choose two Democrats, that means I'm choosing from the three Democrats. I'm choosing two Democrats. And then I need from the two Republicans, I'm choosing one. So what does that give me? This uh, three choose two, is, this is three times two, which is six. So this is two Democrats, right? Two Dems or three Democrats. That means from the three Democrats, I'm choosing three. That means from the two Republicans, I'm choosing none. This is one. And this is one. This gives me one. By uh, the alternative principle, six plus one equals seven. Okay? So that would be the correct answer. The correct answer should be seven. So now let's see. What's wrong with the following? First, choose the two Democrats from the three. And then from the remaining Republicans, ah, very. So the question is, what's wrong with that? And let me tell you how old you think about it. You need to understand that you're counting something twice. So what you ought to do, if you want to understand what's wrong with it, write out the cases. And, and the reason this problem is here, a number of years ago, I gave this, pro, uh, uh, I gave this problem on an exam. And I had a student do it the, the wrong way. And it took me a couple of minutes to figure out what was wrong with the reason. So I'd like you to do the same thing now figure out what's wrong with the reason. And basically what's happening is you're counting something more than once. And that's what you need to be careful of. Were there any other questions? Anybody? Okay. So let's, um, let's go on and talk about other things then. So uh, let's do a little bit more counting. Now, remember, I want you to understand the only reason I'm doing counting is there are problems that arise in probability theory where you have to know how to count a little bit. There's a whole course on combinatorics that would offer at the 4,000 level. I think it's either 4140 or 4150. And it's just devoted to the notions of combinatorics, counting permutations and, and extensions thereof. Uh, we just want some basics here, and that's my objective. So I think this is probably the last section which involves counting, um, and then we'll talk about why I call the combination symbol the binomial coefficient, and we'll relate that to the uh, binomial theorem, then we can start some probability. Okay, when we were looking at permutations, we we're essentially looking at permutations when all objects were distinct. What do I mean? Suppose I asked you, how many jumbles are possible from these five letters? Everybody understand the question I'm asking? Why is this an interesting question? Or, or excuse me, let me turn my phone off here. Okay. Um, it's an interesting question, it's, or it's, I should say it's a different question, because we have three L's. Now, for the moment, let's, make, let's pretend the L's were all different. So I have L1, L1, L2, and L3. Well, if they were all different, the answer is trivial. The answer would just be five factorial, right? I think any of these, oops, five. I have five choices in the first position four for the second, three for the third, two and one. So if they were all different, the answer would just be five factorial. But notice if I just focus on the L's, suppose I, so what do we have? We have L1, I, L2, L3, well, let's just focus on this one particular permutation. Now I could also write this as uh, L, um, L1, I, 
L3, L2, Y. I can also write this as L2, I, L1, L3. I can write this as L2, I, L3, L1. I can write this as L3, I, L1, L2, Y. L3, I, L2, L1, Y. These six. If the L's were different, just this, just this permutation would give rise to six. So my question is, why six? Because if you forget about the I and the Y, how many ways can these three different L's, if they were different, be jumbled? Three factorial. Three factorial. Which means, if they were all different, I would have five factorial different jumbles. But I got to divide through by the repetition, which is three factorial, which by the way gives me an answer of 20. Okay? So does everybody understand the reason? So this is, ju this is just one of 20 different permutations that I can have of these letters if, if, if the L's were the same. Here's another example. Mississippi. Notice if they were all different, how many letters are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 11. Was it 11, three, six? Yeah. If they were all different, the answer would be 11 factorial, but I have uh, four I's. I have four S's, I have two P's, and an N. Well, I don't have to divide three by that. So uh, I'm not interested in the actual numerical lands here, but notice what's one way of doing this problem is to pretend they were all different and essentially divide through by the multiplicities. And that's what's happening here. Okay, uh, let's look at this another way. Let's go back to the lily. If you think about the jumble, you think about the permutation, there are really five positions here. So let's choose three of these positions for the L's. How many positions are now left? Well, if I use the three L's, there are two positions left. Let's choose one of those two positions for the I. And now there's one position left for the Y. So by the way, this is five factorial over three factorial, two factorial. This is two factorial over one factorial. And this is just one. So notice this cancels this. I end up with five factorial over three factorial. Similarly with Mississippi, M I S S I L S S I P P I. I can choose, there are 11 positions, let's choose four of them for the S's. Now there are seven positions left, let's choose four of them for the I's. And now there are uh, uh, three positions left, let's choose two of them for the P's. And now there's one position left for the M. So this gives me 11 factorial over four factorial, seven factorial times seven factorial over four factorial, three factorial, three factorial over two factorial, one factorial, and one choose one is one. So um, this can't- I have, a, I have a random question. Where did that seven- Oh, let me just finish this and take a question. This cancels this. So I get 11 factorial, over four factorial times four factorial times two factorial times one factorial, which is what I got. Where is that? Up here. I can always add a one factorial. Remember, one factorial was one. Okay, your, your random question. That was a, a little bit too fast. I, I was just wondering where that seven factorial came in, but someone already said it in the chat. Here? Okay, so, so easy enough to show. Ready? First, let's do this.
One more time. Most of the first method, because it seems like you don't even have to think there. Okay, so I have a MIS, SIS, SIPPI. So if you think of any word, it's going to have 11 positions, right? There are, it has 11 spots in the word. So I want to choose four of those positions for the eyes. So from the 11, I choose four of those positions for the eyes. So I have 11, I just chose four. How many positions are now left? Seven, because I've already filled four of the 11 positions. So now I'll, I'll, I'll do the next letter. I have seven choices. I'll choose um, four of the S's. That means I've now used up four positions for the first letter four positions for the, you know, for, the, for the repeated first letter, for the repeated second letter. That means there, there are uh, three positions left for the, two, uh, for the two Ps. And now there's one position left for the remaining M. And this just turns out to be 11 factorial over four factorial times seven factorial, seven factorial over four factorial, three factorial, three factorial over two factorial, one factorial. And this is just, uh, well, I don't need this last one, it's one. And now we get some cancellations. So this gives us 11 factorial over four factorial, four factorial, two factorial, one factorial. Notice the sum of all the numbers at the bottom add up to the top. So while I'm here, let me define a new symbol, no, okay? Notice the symbol N choose R is really N over N factorial times N minus R factorial. Notice the bottoms, ignoring the factorials, add up to the top. So for example, Five, choose three, is five factorial over three factorial times two factorial. And notice these two numbers on the bottom give me the top. Now, if I wanted to be technical, what I could have done is I could have said, why don't I use this symbol? Think about this symbol, because this is telling me that it's five factorial divided by three factorial times two factorial. Wouldn't this have been a nice symbol to use? And the answer is it is, but you don't really need it because when you have this one, you know there's only one other symbol missing. So consider the following new symbol. I'll generalize it in a second. Suppose I have eight, three, two, three. Suppose I wanted to find this symbol. Well, notice the bottoms, three plus two plus three add up to eight. I can define this symbol to be eight factorial over three factorial times two factorial times three factorial. That is more generally, suppose I have the following, N, N1, N2, N sub K, where the sum of all the, all the terms in the bottom add up to the top, okay? Notice in this example right here, the bottom adds up to the top. I will then define this symbol to equal n factorial over n1 factorial times n2 factorial and so on up through n sub k factorial. This symbol has a name. It's called the multi, I spelled that wrong. Multi, one more time. Okay. It's called the multinomial coefficient. Now notice I didn't need it. The problem I did a minute ago was, remember Lily? 
Remember the answer right there was five factorial over three factorial, which turned out to be 20. Turns out I could have written this as just uh, five, three, one, one. Notice there were three L's. It was one I and one and one I and one um, Y. But I don't really need it to do that problem. I was able to do this problem two other ways using combinations or using a, a, the ratio of the two factorials. But it's a useful, it's a useful number that, uh, that we're going to talk about a little later on. Again, it's called the multinomial coefficient. Uh, let me, let me uh, ask you a different problem, OK? The, um, the Chinese delegation is coming to the White House, OK? And the White House has uh, 10 flagpoles in a row. And they want to display seven American flags and three Chinese flags. How many ways can that be done? Does everybody understand the question? So I have these 10 flagpoles, and we want to put on these flagpoles seven American flags and three Chinese flags. How many ways can we do this? Anybody have an idea? Um, we could. Okay. Just n factorial. Well, let me rephrase the question for you. I have a a a a a a a and c c c. Right. That's one way of displaying the flags. Right. So really the question is how many jumbles are possible of these 10 letters? Well, if they were all different, then I would have 10 factors, right? But they're not all different. I have to divide by the number of ways the A's can be repeated or jumbled and the C's. So the answer would be what? 10, 9, 8. Seven factorial, seven factorial, three, two, one. This cancels this. Three is three, two is four, 120. Okay, everyone got that example? So notice when objects are repeated or identical, in order to count the number of ways, you got to divide through basically by the repetition. If we had seven American flags and three Chinese flags, we had to divide through. Now I'm going to take this one step further. I'm going to consider two more examples of this case. Okay, um, I have twelve students in a class. And what I want to do is I want to partition them. I want to divide these students up into three, three committees, a research committee, a, um, uh, a recreation committee, and the third committee is a cleanup. How many ways can I do this? Okay, well, uh, if you think about this for a second, well, let's first choose, well, I should have said three committees where each, each committee has uh, four students, right? We want the committees to be the same size. Okay. So let's choose from the 12 students, let's choose four of them for the research committee. And then there are eight students left. Let's choose four of them for the recreation committee. 
And now there are four students left. Let's choose them for the cleanup committee. By the way, you should realize this, of course, is, is a symbol I just used a minute ago, 12, 4, 4, 4. I could have done it that way as well. But let's just, so this is going to end up being 12 factorial over 4 factorial times 4 factorial times 4 factorial. So it looked like that was a pretty easy problem to solve, and it was. I did it quickly because I have a lot more experience than you. I don't have to think about it too hard. But it worked out okay. Anybody have a question about this one? Professor, just a quick question. On the exam, you want us the uh, last answer, like calculate those factorials, or you want us to leave if it? The number, generally, the, I don't want to talk about exams now, but generally the rules are if, if the numbers are relatively small, you work them out. If they're large, you leave them factorial. Okay, thank you. And now I want to take the same problem. Okay, almost the same problem. 12 students. Uh, how do I word it here? Into three committees. Each of four, uh, containing four students. Now, what's the difference between this problem and the previous problem? In this problem, in the previous problem, there were three separate committees. They were distinguishable. Now the committees are no longer distinguishable. They're identical committees. It's sort of the same thing. What's the difference in A, B, C, D, E? How many jumbles can I make of these letters versus how many jumbles can I make of these letters? Well, this is just bifactorial, right? Because they're all different. Here they're not all different. We have to divide through by repetition. Now the same thing is happening between these two committees. The first problem was they were indistinguishable. The committees were different. So the answer was just 12, 4, 4, 4. But now I have to divide through because the committees, it's like having three L's in the, in the problem. I have to divide through by the repetition of three factorial because the committees are, are, are now indistinguishable. The three L's were indistinguishable. So while they looked like it was the same problem, in one case, the committees were different. So there was no repetition. In the second case, there was repetition. That's a very subtle uh, idea. Please uh, keep that in mind. Okay. How am I doing time-wise? Where's my clock? Okay. Um, the last idea about combinations, uh, and then we'll just look at some interesting things. Um, this is called the method of stars and bars. Can you guys still hear me? There's a machine going on in the background. How can yeah, I speak? Somebody want to answer me? Yes, Professor. We yeah, Professor, we can hear you. You can hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. yes Professor. Okay. Let me see. My, I'm trying to remember where my, I put my uh, headphones. Um, all right. Professor, if, we just holler, can hear I'll you. We don't hear this location. now. Okay. So I'm talking about the method of stars and bars. Now that's a weird name. So let me, firstly, it has that name because uh, it comes from a book by Feller and he coined the name. So let me begin with a problem. And it, at first it looks like a very hard problem. It looks like there are many, many cases to consider. But I want to show you, if you think about it the right way, it becomes a trivial problem. So here's the problem. Uh, I want to distribute eight identical books uh, 
among four students. So let's think about the question for a second, okay? Just to realize if you, if you try to do it in some particular way, there are lots and lots of cases to consider because if you think about it, you can take all the books and give them to one student, right? There are four students here. Or you can take three books to one student, one book to the second student, the other student, or whatever, whatever's left over to the other student. So it seems that if you try to handle it directly, there are gonna be lots and lots of different cases. So let me show you the nice way of thinking about this, and then we can generalize the method, and then we can see how it's applicable to other kinds of problems. Okay, so let's suppose the students are, have names, A, B, C, and D. So let me give you an illustration. A, B, C, Uh, hold on, this is all right. Um, so here's an example. I can get A, three books. So I'm, I'm representing the books by a star. I can give B one book. I can give C two books, three, four, five, six. And then I would give D two books. So that's one way of distributing. Everybody see that? Let's look at another way. So here I gave A6, B1, C1, and D9. That's another way of distributing these eight identical books. One more. A got none, B got none, C got none, and D got, D got all eight. Notice in every one of these diagrams that I just drew, essentially we have, there are, if you think of the books as being the stars, we have eight stars. And to divide this four students up, we end up with three bars. Here's a, here's one bar, oops, sorry. There's one bar, two bars, Three bars. I only need three bars to, the, to the break up the four students, right? So notice in every one of these, I have 10 positions. I have eight stars and three bars. Why three bars? Because there were four people. And to break them up, to the, separate them, I only need three bars. Everybody see that? Yeah. So let's rephrase, it, rephrase this problem. I can rephrase the pro problem as follows. Okay. Choose eight bars from. Oh, I'm sorry. That's wrong. I don't have eight bars. Choose. Um, eight stars from the 10 positions. Meaning, I have, from, I'm sorry, they're from the, uh, how many positions do I have? 11 positions. Yep. I have eight Wait, what bars, do we have? right? Sorry, Professor, why do we have 11 positions? Because I have eight bars. If you look at this. Oh, eight stars and three bars. My bad. One, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Each bar and each star takes up a position. So however I distribute these books, which are the stars and the bars among the people, there are a total of 11 positions here. So every time I count, I'm really asking how many committees of eight can I choose from the 11? Or equivalently, from the 11 positions, how many of those positions could be the bars? Right? Here, I can either choose the positions for the stars or the positions for the bars. And that's really cool. So what sounded like a really, really difficult problem, if you think about choosing stars and bars, it's really very simple. Let's look at another example. Um, nine identical candy bars are to be distributed among five students. How many ways can this be done? Well, if you think of the candy bars that are identical as being the stars, and if I have five students, how many bars do I need to divide them up? Four. I have five students, there are gonna be four bars. So I have a, third, a total of 13 positions, and I wanna choose nine of them for the stars, or 13 choose four. Either one is the correct answer. And it's easy to work out. I'm not, sure, I'm not doing the arithmetic now. Everyone follow this solution because I'm gonna, now I'm, I'm changing it. You ready? Same problem. Let's assume one of the students is the youngest student. And now let's assume the youngest must receive at least two bars, two candy bars. Let me say candy bars. How does that change the problem? Well, here's the easy way to do that. Let's suppose a whoever the youngest student is, before you do anything, Give the youngest student two bars, right? How many bars are now left? Well, if I gave you two bars, I, I have um, how many candy bars were there all together? There were nine originally, right? So now there are seven bar, seven, seven candy bars left to distribute among. the five students among the four bars. That is by giving the youngest student right in the back two, we're gonna, we now distribute the remaining seven bars among the five students or four bars. So now we have 11 positions and we wanna choose seven or four and that would solve the problem. There's our solution. So again, if you think about what I just did, to guarantee that the younger student gets at least two candy bars, I gave him two right up front. And then I only have to distribute the remaining seven bars among the five students. Anybody have a question about that? Hey, can you just repeat that? I didn't really- I'm sorry, say again. Can you repeat? You went a little bit too fast for, uh, for me. Okay, yeah, so right. let's do it again. So again, we have, um, what did I say, nine candy bars, right? You gave away two because like the youngest one gets two. So now you're left with seven candy bars. Okay, so if, I have a, if the youngest student gets two, has to get at least two, right? That means I'm gonna have seven left. Uh, yes. 
But already I know by giving the younger student two right up front, I've taken care of him and he may get more, but he'll get at least two. So now I have the seven students, seven, uh, I'm sorry, I have seven candy bars left. The five students give me four bars. So I have 11 positions to now fill. I just have to choose seven of them. Because now, remember the younger student is still here, so he may be getting more, he may be getting more. And for those of you who like answers, this is just uh, whatever, okay. So um, let's disguise the problem a little bit, okay? Uh, how many non negative um, integer solutions are there to how many do I have here? Um, equal 32. Okay, here's the problem. How many non-negative integer solutions are there to the equation x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5 equal 32? For example, x1, x2, x3, x4 could all be zero, and x5 could be 32. That would be one solution. Or x1, x2, x3, and x4 could each be three, and x5, or three times four is 12, could be 20. Or x1 equals x2, which equals x3, which equals x4, which is five, so five, 10, 15, 20, and the next five would be 12. That's another solution. Everybody understand what I mean by solutions now? Or here's another solution. X1 equals X2 equals X3 equals zero, X4 equals X5, which is 16. All of you would check. So each of these is either a, a zero or a, or a positive integer. So I'm asking how many solutions are possible? Does everybody now understand the question? Okay, so how do we do this problem? Well, suppose I change the problem a little bit. Suppose I tell you I have five, I have uh, five students and I have 32 candy bars. And how many ways can I distribute these 32 candy bars among these five students? I want you to understand this is exactly the same problem. Right? Every time I give a student a candy bar, think of the first student's name as being x1, the second student's name is x2, x3 for the third student, and so on. And think of it. Uh, Think of uh, the number 32 is representing the number of candy bars I have possible. How many ways can I distribute the candy bars? Well, I have 32 stars. If I have five students, how many bars do I have? Four bars. Four bars. So I have a, a total of 36 positions. I have to choose four. Do I actually give the answer here? Um, Uh, it's like 50, almost 59,000 ways. Okay. So now I'm going to make the problem a little more complicated, okay? Same problem. X1 plus X2 plus X3 plus X4 plus X5. Again, they're all, they're all going to be integers now. And X1, each of these, 
Every one of these must be greater than or equal to one. So now I only want positive integer solutions. I don't want to, you know, I want to make sure nobody gets nothing. So again, it's almost the same problem. Uh, why is it almost the same problem? Because I'm now distributing 32 candy bars. There were originally 32 candy bars among five students. But I want each one to get at least one. Well, how can I do that? Is let's start by giving everybody, every one of these five people one. So how many bars did I just distribute? I've just distributed five bars. So how many are left? 27. So now there are 27 stars left, right? Because I've already taken care of this condition now by giving everybody one. And if there are five students, that means there are four bars. So I have three positions. I want to choose four, whatever that number turns out to be. That's the number of ways, number of solutions I have to this equation where, where uh, each of these x values is one or more. So what this restriction did, this guaranteed that, uh, the, that there were only positive integer solutions to this problem. Okay, so stars and bars is really a powerful method. Remember to get the bars, we subtracted one, meaning if we had five students, we end up with four bars. Uh, I think that's all I want to do in this particular section. Yeah, that's a nice problem, but I'm not doing it. Okay, so um, make sure you do the exercise in section 1.5. And now I just want to talk a little bit about it. I mean, I will conclude the counting basically, but I want to talk a little bit about um, Professor, I had a quick question. Yeah. So when you said the each of the element has to be at least one, um, shouldn't it be like uh, 27 choose four instead of 31 choose four? Say that again, please. So basically when you said that um, uh, the condition that X1, X2, et cetera, has to be either, at least one. So when you write the notation, shouldn't it be 27 and then four underneath it? No, uh, hold on, if I give each one. There were originally 32, and there were five people that I was giving one to, right? So, so think, subtract five from 32, what do you get? Five from 32 is 27, right? 27, yeah. That's where I get the 27 from. Okay. So, okay. Are, are we okay? So putting it in notation form, uh, how would you do that? What do you mean out there? I, here's my, my, my notation form is right here. He's this confused is, because you added, you have to add the bars to the total at the top. You we to add we the need the bar. The bars don't change. When I'm distributing the numbers, the, the candy bars among the students, the students are the bars. They're not, they're not changing. What changed because of the, of the restriction were well, the stars. I'm now distributing. I've already distributed up front the five bars. So now I'm taking the remaining 27 bars and I'm distributing them among the five bars. The 27 stars among the five bars. Okay? Okay. Four bars. Okay. How many of you have heard of uh, Pascal's triangle? Anybody? I've heard of it, but like, I don't know what it is. I forgot what it was. Okay, well, let me remind you. 
Let's suppose a problem is to compute x plus y to the n. Pascal figured out a very clever way of doing it. And the question is, why does it work? And how can we do it more simply? So Pascal, uh, notice, by the way, when, when I took something like x plus y to the 10th, the first term would be x to the 10th. The next term would turn out to be, uh, uh, in this case, 10, x to the ninth, y. The next term, if I work it out, would be, uh, would be 45, x to the eighth, y squared, and so on. Notice that the powers are always adding up to 10. We start with x to the 10th and go down by one, and, and the y's go up by one. So in general, if we actually wanted to compute something like this, for example, just a small number, the first term is x to the fifth. Then there's a number times x to the fourth y plus a number times x to the cube y squared plus a number x squared y cubed plus a number x y to the fourth plus some number, which by the way is one, y to the fifth. And what Pascal did is he, he, he developed a formulaic way of finding these missing numbers. So let me show you what he did and then we'll have to figure out why it works. It's just a simple application of, uh, of combinations. So here's what he did. He put down a one. Second row, one and one. Third row, one. And then he said, well, what is one plus one? Two, then he puts down a one. Then he puts down a one. He says, what is one plus two? Three. What is two plus one? Three. And he puts down a one. Let me do one more row. One, three plus one is four. Three plus three is six. Three plus one is four. And then we put down a one. Everyone see the pattern? Well, it turns out that this first row gives the coefficients for x plus y to the zero power. The next row gives x plus y to the first power. The next row is x plus y squared, x plus y cubed, and so on. So if I want to find, say, x plus y to the fourth power, the coefficients would be 1, x to the fourth, plus 4, x cubed y, plus 6, x squared y squared, plus 4, x y cubed, plus y to the fourth, or I should say one y to the fourth. Everyone see the pattern? Now, this is pretty good for, you know, for expanding binomials where the power is relatively small. But suppose I wanted the, uh, the problem was to find the 83rd term of x plus y to the 127th power. There's no way I want to do this, draw 127 lines in Pascal's triangle to do this calculation. So there are two questions here. One, how does Pascal's triangle work? And two, is there a better method? How am I doing time wise? Okay, I'll give you a. So um, I want to remind you uh, of the following. There's an identity, n choose k. Now I showed you, uh, let's suppose we have n minus one people. And Sam. So we have a total of n people. Sam is one of them, and the balance is n minus one. 
Now, if I want to choose a committee of K, there are two ways of doing this. Sam is on the committee. Or Sam is not on the committee. Well, if Sam is on the committee from the remaining N minus one people, you only need K minus one people, right? And if Sam is off the committee, you still need K people from the remaining N minus one. So we have a, an interesting identity. It turns out that this is the identity once I show you why something else is true. Uh, again, uh, one, three, three, one. I, I'm down the table with it. One, four, six, four, one, one, five, ten, ten, five, one. Okay. Firstly, notice that this number is turns out to be, this number is five, choose zero. We'll see why in a minute. This number is five, choose one. This number is five, choose two. This number is five, choose three, and so on. This number is four, choose one. This number is four, choose two. This is four, choose three, and so on. Now notice, how did I get this number, 10? Five choose two, which is 10, is equal to four choose two plus four choose three. Four choose two, if I put six, this is four. This is exactly the identity that I have up here. N is five, K is two, uh, except that I have a um, Uh, I did this term first below and this term second. That doesn't make a difference. So firstly, the way, the reason Pascal's triangle works is because uh, if this is n minus one, let me just draw it in a picture. Um, n minus one, k minus one, n minus one, k. When these come together, these give you nk, the next row below. So if you look at any, any two entries in Pascal's triangle, if you observe that they're each uh, binomial coefficients, the, the triangle works the way the triangle is generated is using this identity. Now that only answers half the question. Why is it that the coefficients in a binomial expansion actually turn out to be precisely these numbers. Let me give you an example. So let's suppose I want to compute x plus y to the 15. According to what I just said, this would equal to 15 choose 0, x to the 15th, plus 15 choose 1, x to the 14th, y, plus 15 choose 2, oops, x to the 13th, y squared, and so on. 15 choose um, 14, x, y to the 14th, plus 15 choose 15, x to the 0, y to the 15th. So the question is that we have to answer that I don't have enough time to answer now is, why did these numbers turn out to be the binomial coefficients? So we pick that up next Monday, okay? So I'm, I'm going to stop here. If anybody came in late today, I have to be in a committee meeting in about two minutes, so I can't hang around. Um, Send me an email today so I can correct the attendance. Please do the homework in section 1.5. I just began 1.6, which will finish the preliminary chat material.
So we start discussing probability. We don't meet on Wednesday. We do meet on uh, the following Monday. So uh, make sure you do your work. You have questions. You can't wait until Monday. Send me an email. I'll try to work it out for you. Are we good? Let me stop the recording.